you've delivered us so that we can listen to another message. I pray, Father in heaven, that we would understand uh, things that we've not understood in the past about judges. Um, thank you so much, Lord, that you've given us Ashley to help us, uh, that she is a, a faithful student of yours. And I thank you, Lord, for all the participants, each one, Lord, be with them as they study tonight. I pray let you open our hearts and our minds that we would finally yield to you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Markham. Thank you. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I love studying the book of Judges, um, especially as a middle school history teacher. The more history I understand in the background, the more it comes alive and the more it helps me appreciate God and the delivers that he sent. So this guy that you can see from the screen is Shamgar. He's a guy we don't really talk about that much, but we're going to learn about him tonight. Um, this other guy that you see on the screen, that's Abimelech, and those are 70 of his brothers that he killed. Kind of crazy, but it's an important part as we study the book of Judges. So tonight, in a nutshell, we're basically going to go through some of the background to Judges. There was always a pattern. The same exact thing happened every single time. We're going to look at that pattern, and there's 13 Judges. Now, some people say 15 because they count Samuel and they count Eli, but technically they're in first and second Samuel, so we're not covering them this week. So in the book of Judges, there's actually only 13 judges. And then next week, there's two more in the book of first Samuel. And lastly, um, it is historically interesting. Um, it keeps you on your toes. It makes you want to study more. But especially as God's end time people, we really want to apply it to our lives. And that ultimately is the purpose of tonight's study. So to begin with, I have two questions for you. What was your first exposure to judges? And do you have a favorite story? Hmm. Well, my first exposure is really preparing for tonight's lesson. I've read through <laughs> probably 12 chapters. I didn't finish wow. them all. But I remember our pastor re uh, referred to judges as the yo-yo years. And that was the cycle I think you were alluding to, Ashley, of uh, sin, repent, forgiveness, and sin again. And that cycle kept on going throughout the whole book. Oh, that, do you mind saying that one more time? You summed it up perfectly. What was that pattern? Well, they, uh, Pastor Lucas at Cape Coral SDA Church referred to it as the yo-yo years. Mm -hmm. And he said the, the Israelites would sin, they would repent. Uh, the Lord would forgive them, and then they go back to sinning again. And that cycle just kept repeating itself throughout the book of Judges. Oh, thank you for sharing. That That was like summed up so nice and concise. Thank you. Does anyone have a favorite story from Judges? Maybe as a kid, something you remember or something you recently read? I enjoyed the story about the stories about Samson. Mm -hmm. Amen. I remember as a middle overcome school. with women. Oh yeah, what were you saying? Sorry. Right. Sorry. I no, said he was easily overcome with women. Yeah. Uh, we're not that way today, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I remember as a middle school student, um, I went to my friend's house, and I think we were like in seventh grade, and my parents were like very um, strict growing up, rightfully so. I, I thank them for that. And like other kids, like you go to their house, you could stay up all night, watch whatever you wanted, eat whatever you wanted. Um, but then as a result, when you do that, like my friends would sleep until like one or two o'clock until Sunday morning. And in my household, that was never even an option. I never even knew people did that. Like even on weekends, we had to get up at regular time. So, I mean, I must've woke up at like eight o'clock and I'm like, when are they gonna get up? You know, and it's like hour after hour. So I think my mind was just rotted from like all the filth I had watched. So I just picked up a Bible and I remember I was reading through the book of Judges and I must occupy like several hours that day because they were just sleeping and, you know, I wanted to read and do something. But I remember even as a kid, those stories, they're pretty horrific, but they're actually pretty fascinating as well. And um, they're not all good stories, but 1 Corinthians 10, 11 tells us all of this is written as our examples so that we can learn from it. So I don't know if that was my first exposure, but I do remember reading it on that Sunday morning several decades ago, and I actually still like to read it today. So what we're going to do first is I have like this short four minute video. Um, it's from this Seventh-day Amateurs company called Lineage Journey, and we've watched them before. 
But basically, even if the stories are familiar to you, it always helps to understand where it's happening. And it always understands to get a visual of the archaeology, of the buildings, of the rocks, of the cliffs. So what I'm going to be pulling up on the screen here is basically where a lot of these stories are taking place. They're going to give us a quick summary of what's happening in Judges. And then as much as possible, they're trying to film on location. And this will kind of give us a background as to what we're going to study tonight. So if you can't see or hear anything, just put your thumb down and I'll know to fix it. But it should be working. So this is Lineage Journey, Episode 11, The Judges. After they took the city of Jericho and moved inland, there was still a lot of work to do. The land was occupied, but this was the area God had promised he would give them. He had promised that if they diligently kept his commandments and followed him, that he would clear out the land and drive out the nations from the river Euphrates to the Mediterranean. They were warned that if they didn't do this, the people would be a constant thorn in their side. Sadly, they failed to heed the advice given them. And Judges 1 verse 28 says that they failed to utterly drive them out. They chose the course of ease and they mingled and intermarried with the various heathen tribes around them. Soon heathenism and idolatry spread amongst the Israelites and they served as captives in the land that had been promised them. The king of Mesopotamia, Eglon, king of Moab, the Canaanites and the Philistines all became oppressors of Israel. On each occasion, God raised up a deliverer, Othniel, Shamgar, Ehud, Deborah and Barak. There was a cycle. They fell into captivity and remained in captivity until they cried out to God for the deliverer. Then God raised up a judge who delivered them and they were free from captivity often as long as the judge was alive. Then when the judge died, they fell back into apostasy and captivity. So often this is the case with us. We have ups and downs in our spiritual lives, sometimes strong and sometimes weak. Before crossing the River Jordan into Israel, the Midianites had almost been wiped out. But a small number remained, and over time they grew, became powerful, and oppressed Israel for seven years. God raised up Gideon to deliver his people. Gideon was hesitant to take on the call and asked God three times to show evidence that he was with him. After whittling down his men from 32,000 to 300, he won the battle in the most extraordinary way. God was making a point. I am the one who has the power. Trust me and not yourselves. But perhaps the most famous judge in Israel had a very mixed reign, and his name was Samson. Born into the tribe of Dan in the family of Manoah, he was consecrated as a Nazarite at birth. No wine, no unclean foods, and his hair was not to be cut. However, living close to the Philistines, he mingled with them and married one with disastrous results. Then he was a judge for 20 years. As he got older, though, his old weaknesses came back, and he was ultimately seduced by Delilah to give away the source of his strength. As a prisoner to the Philistines, he ended up killing more Philistines at his death than during his life, and it's believed he is buried here at the top of this hill. Many of the judges did have disadvantages. Ehud was left-handed, Gideon was outnumbered. Samson, though, did have physical strength, but maybe this contributed to his downfall because he trusted in his own strength rather than in the one who was the source of his strength. God was always trying to teach his people to rely on him, not to rely on their own strength, not to rely on the strength of their armies, but to rely solely on him. He who had brought them from Egypt to Canaan miraculously would deliver them if they trusted in him. God wants us to have a consistent walk with him, not one that goes up and down all the time, but for us to learn to trust implicitly in him based on how he has led either us or others in the past. When we remember how good God has been to us, we can know and have the assurance that when we confront obstacles that seem insurmountable, such as the Midianites to Gideon, 
we can know that God has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. So that is Judges in a nutshell. Um, obviously, he didn't go through all 13 Judges, but he hit the highlights. And I personally didn't know that they have a tombstone for Samson and they think they know where his body is. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go back to this in just a second and then we can continue on tonight. So I like how Jeff summarized judges, like there's always a pattern and we're all gonna keep referring back to that pattern several times. But before we get to that, just to give you a context, um, we know Genesis is all about creation, the patriarchs, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses deals primarily with the Exodus of them coming out of Egypt. Leviticus is when they're around Mount Sinai and God's giving them all the laws. Numbers takes place like during those years in the wilderness. Deuteronomy is right before they enter the promised land, and Judges is when they're in the promised land. At this point, Moses is obviously dead. Joshua is dead, and there's different judges that God raises up at different times to lead his people. But at this time, in other parts of the world, China is actually one of the most ancient of civilizations. Um, they're already trading with Europe. So sometimes people actually had better connections back then than they do today. Um, Phoenicia was this worldwide empire. They had uh, well, we know that they had colonies in Africa, Europe, and Asia. There's some speculation that they got to America, but there's not a lot of proof for that, so we're not quite sure. Uh, many of you might have read the Odyssey and the Iliad in high school or college, and you're probably famous with that really famous story on top, probably familiar with it. Um, basically, Helen of Troy, the most beautiful woman back then, she was stolen by Paris. He was a prince who had come to visit Menelaus. Menelaus, for some reason, let his guard down. Paris steals his wife, Helen. They go back to Turkey. They go back to Troy. And Menelaus is going to let it go. But his brother, Agamemnon, is like, I can't believe he did this to you. You need to show him that he cannot do this. So they cross the Mediterranean. It was the most ships this world has ever seen, except for D-Day. They get to Troy, and they lay siege to it for 10 years. And a lot of crazy stuff happens during those 10 years. But basically, at the end, the Greeks pretend like they're going to go home. And they leave this massive horse. They call it the Trojan horse. They leave it outside the city gates. The people think it's like this offering to their gods. They bring it in. During the night, Greek soldiers jump out of that horse. They overtake the city. And that leads to the fall of Troy. Um, you can actually still go see Troy today. It's all ruins. Um, it's been built upon several times, but it's still ruins. And this is actually taking place during the time of the judges. So everything you learn in Judges, actually, you could relate it to world history. And if you remember anything from the Odyssey and from um, the Iliad, a lot of the way people fought, a lot of the things they did to each other, even the way they mutilated each other's bodies, that's actually going to surface in the Bible because it was very, very common back then. There's a ton of violence. There's a ton of gore in the book of Judges, and people sometimes blame God for that. It's not God's fault. The people rebelled against God, and that's the, what they resorted to doing. So we're going to take a quick look at some of the background information. The first one is found in Acts, and it's going to tell us how long this period was. And then if one, someone else could read Judges 21, 15, that's going to tell us what life was like during this time. And then somebody else could read Judges 2, 16, and that's going to tell us why specifically God raised up Judges. So someone could read from Acts, someone could read from Judges 21, and someone else can read from Judges 2. So the first question is, how long was this period? What was the Acts reference? Oh, sorry, um, Acts chapter 13, verse 20. I have it. Okay. Okay. So after that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. Thank you. So this period takes place over 450 years, and it was not a pleasant time. So if someone could read Judges 21 15, that's going to tell us what it was like. I got that one. The people grieve for Benjamin because the Lord had made a gap in the tribes of Israel. Um, I'm sorry, I think I put, 
Oh, I should have put verse 25 instead of 15. I'm sorry. Oh, Can you I read 25? Sorry. That's even shorter. <laughs> In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Uh, that's huh. a horrible like thing now. to do. Horrible to do what you think is okay, because if you look at that picture on the bottom, to me, that's one of the most horrific stories in scripture. People blame God, but it's not God's fault. Um, basically, this Levite, he married, he had this concubine. So it's basically like you have a wife, but a concubine is kind of like second status. Um, she belongs to you, but she's still kind of like a slave. She doesn't have the same rights as a wife. Um, they got in a fight. She went back to her dad, and then he decided he wanted to woo her. He wanted her back. So it goes and gets her. They go back home. Um, they're riding along the way. Um, they stop in someone's house at nighttime, and the old man takes care of them. But then everybody in the area, um, they start pounding on the door, demanding sick and gruesome things, um, just like they tried to do to Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. And what's really sad is the old man and this man here, this husband, are like, hey, don't touch us, but take this woman instead. And they throw her out there. Obviously, the evil men do what they do. And her last thing is crawling to the threshold, and then she dies on the threshold. And then her husband cuts her body up in 12 pieces, sends it to all 12 tribes. It says, help me defend her. Help me take vengeance on her, or else I'm going to do this to you. And that's really graphic. That's really gruesome. I always wondered, like, why was this included in scripture? But I think it's because of Joshua 21.15 or 21.25. When people do what's right in their own eyes, nothing good happens. Um, at first, it might seem like it's okay, but then horrible things like this start happening. And I think that's why God included the story in scripture. But God did not give up on them. In fact, Judges 2.16 tells us why God sent Judges. So if someone could please read that first. I've got it in front of me. Then the Lord raised up Judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Amen. Mark, do you remember what you shared about God being our judge, like what the word judge actually means? Do you remember sharing in our- Yeah, he's a deliverer. That's, that's the, the whole point of that verse, at least for me, was that God is a deliverer. He's always a deliverer. He's a savior. <laughs> so I always like that verse. <laughs> So God delivered up the people to their sinful ways, but then he raised up judges to deliver them, to save them. And Amen. just like Jeff said earlier, there is a pattern. You know, God raises up a judge, but then they turn to other gods. Then Israel is subject to other nations. Then they turn to God for help. And once again, he raises up a judge. So it keeps going on and on and on for 450 years. And if we're quite frank with ourselves, it still goes on today. I'm sure that you can probably see this pattern in your life at times. I know I certainly see it in my life, unfortunately. So this is a pattern that we as Seventh-day Adventists, we need to be aware of so that we can break this pattern and turn away from it. God sent a total of 15 judges, but in the book of Judges itself, there's only 13. And then the first Samuel, it talks about Eli and it talks about Samuel. On this list here, they didn't include Barak, um, probably because Deborah ended up saving the day but technically he was a judge as well. So I liked the visual. I put it up here, but um, most people consider Barak or Barak. Um, they consider him a judge as well. But our first judge, um, personally, in my opinion, and in the opinions of a lot of Bible commentators that I read, Anthoniel was the biggest and the best. He was the most godly and he was also the most warlike. Um, as an old man, he was still conquering territory. Um, he actually married his cousin, which Back then, that was actually fairly normal. Even in American society, um, the Puritans in New England, they said, hey, that's wrong. That's a little too close for comfort. But Southerners, even in the 16 and 1700s, even in the 1800s, a lot of them were comfortable with marrying their cousins. And it was actually culturally acceptable, probably until about the 1900s. Um, but even in many countries of the world, um, even in parts of the Caribbean, it is common. So especially back then in Bible times, there's nothing wrong with this per se. Um, he married his cousin, who ironically was Caleb's daughter. We know that Caleb and Joshua were the only two spies that were faithful, and their lineage went on. Um, Ash uh, Aksa, I'm not quite sure how you say her name. She was a very godly woman. Um, Caleb's, <clears throat> that was Caleb's daughter. 
um, Caleb's nephew was actually Othniel, and he was a very godly man as well. So if somebody could please read Judges 3, 9 through 11, um, that's going to tell us what Othniel was like. And then somebody else can read verse 12, and that's going to tell us what happened after he died. 3, 9, 9. Why don't I get it here in a second? I've got it. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the for the people of Israel who saved them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan, uh, Rishathatham, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cushan, Rath. Uh, Rissa, any that guy. So the, <laughs> the land had rest 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of uh, Kenaz, died. Is that hey, it? You did, a, you did a great job. I wouldn't be able to say those words. So nice job. <laughs> <laughs> so everything was good for those 40 years. Um, you can actually see that's where they believe that he's buried. Um, people still go there today to view that site. But unfortunately, when he died, something happened. So if someone could please read verse 12. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. So the Moabites are going to factor in again and again and again. Um, if we look at their background, we can go back to Genesis 19, and we know Sodom and Gomorrah <clears throat> were destroyed because of their abominations before the Lord. And then Lot was saved, his daughters were saved. So they run up to this cave. His daughters are scared they won't ever have husbands or a lineage. So they get their father drunk, they get pregnant and the older one has a child first and then the younger one has a child. Um, the older one, her son is basically the father of the Moabites. The younger one, her son is the father of the Ammonites. So these are kind of close relations to the children of Israel. But instead of getting along, they were always bitter, bitter enemies because there was a lot of jealousy between them. And then when we get to the book of Numbers, we see the children of Israel are on the off skirt. Or they're on the, they're on the um, background. They're almost in the promised land. And the Ammonites are actually trying to fight them and annihilate them. So already they're having some conflict with them. And then in Numbers 22, this is a story that you may be familiar with. Um, we know that Balaam was trying to curse them, but God turned his curses into blessings. So finally he said, oh, I can't curse them. This is what I want you to do. Send your most beautiful women. You're going to go down. You're going to mingle. You are going to get them to worship your gods. Ellen White says that they got them drunk. Um, she said that the children of Israel had already been mingling with them. So they were kind of used to seeing these sick, depraved things. And then once they added that alcohol, once they added that music, once they added that dancing, the children of Israel started apostatizing and bowing down to these gods. And in the end, a lot of people took action, especially the Levites, and they ended up killing a lot of these people that has apostatized. Thankfully, not everyone was killed, and those that remained were able to enter the promised land. But that gives you an idea of what Moabite culture was like. Um, I'll send this out to you later. If you want to learn about it more, you can check out a certain chapter from Patriarchs and Prophets. I quoted from page 453, but you can read it more in context if you want to learn a little bit more about that. And not all the Moabites were killed, only those that had actually entered into the camp and were trying to seduce the men. And then there was others that were killed on the battlefield. But in the book of Judges, the Moabites are coming up again and again and again. And I used to think there were these like rinky dink little people that lived in these huts and that just like marched around almost like bandits trying to fight people, but they were a pretty impressive civilization. Um, for example, this is a Moabite castle, which I thought that was a city at first, but it's just a single castle, which is pretty phenomenal. So this just shows you what types of people God was raising up the judges to fight against. And Ehud was the perfect man for the perfect time. God raised him up to fight the Moabites. But he had a particular handicap. To us, it's not a handicap. But in the <laughs> ancient world, it was a major handicap. This was actually bad luck. It was an omen. Um, basically, they thought you must have done something or you were going to do something. And that's why you were born like this. And nothing good could come from this. But God used him anyways. So if somebody could please read Judges 3 verse 12. 
And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Oh, thank you. And do you mind reading? I forgot to put verse 15. Can you put 15? Can you read that one as well? Sure. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up, a deliverer, Elad, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. Oh, thank you. So his handicap was that he was left-handed, which to us is not a big deal, but that was serious bad luck in the ancient world. And for the sake of time, we won't read the whole chapter, but if you want a good story, go read it tonight. It's very interesting. Um, does anybody remember um, what happened to him? Oh, he stabbed him in the belly and the fat came around it. <laughs> yeah, the Bible says it just swallowed it right up as if he hadn't even stabbed him. It just swallowed that dagger right up. Um, he jumps out the window, closes all the doors, and the attendants don't want to bother the king because they think maybe he's going to the bathroom and it's really rude to bother him. So hours and hours go by. Eventually they burst in there and the king is dead. And at that point, it's too late to get Ehud. Um, all the Israelites are rallied up. Um, they get together and God uses him to deliver the Israelites from the Moabites. So what can we learn from him? It's a kind of a crazy story, uh, but what can we learn from the story? Why do you think God included it in scripture? I don't know. Sometimes we uh, we confront evil with uh, with the with a sword. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I agree. I I mean, sometimes I we have to carry weapons. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, being left-handed, I appreciate this story and think God justified it. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Amen. There you go. Yeah, you know, God can use anyone because nowadays being left-handed, you know, there's nothing like that involves bad luck. I mean, nobody looks down upon it. It's not a disability at all. It's basically, I think, a matter of preference or what you feel more comfortable using. Um, but back then it was a handicap. So by God using Ehud, he was basically showing that he can use anyone. Um, he used Othniel. He was a man who came from a godly family. And probably everyone's like, of course he would use him. He's a godly man. He probably never made a mistake. That was probably what some people assumed about him. But Ehud was the opposite. Probably his whole life he had been made fun of. Uh, maybe people thought he wouldn't amount to anything. But God uses him. He saves the day. And it looks like for about 80 years, we're not quite sure how many years he served as judge, um, the Bible doesn't specify, but I had found somewhere else that it was actually 80 years. So if he killed this king as a young man and served for 80 years, he probably died at like 100 something. So God used him for an incredible long period of time, even though people thought that he wasn't able to be used. Then the well, guy that I, oh, you what know, were you gonna say? the thing with being uh, left handed was that he had to have his dagger on his right side. And so I'm sure that uh, everyone was used to uh, people having their daggers on the left side, and it appeared he had he didn't have one. So that's why I think he got into the king and was able to do this because he, he it seemed like a harmless um, you know person coming in. Oh, that's yeah, a great point, part. Rita. Oh, thank yeah. you for bringing that up. Yeah, I, what Frida says, Amen. definitely check that out because the Bible goes into more detail about like where he placed his sword, how he pulled it out. And yeah, it's, it's incredible how God planned the song in advance. He picked the perfect guy for the perfect time. And this should actually say judge number three because we have Othniel was number one. We have Ehud was number two. Um, Shamgar is actually judge number three. And he's this guy who we had at the beginning not a lot of people are familiar with him. I know I'm not familiar with him that much because literally there's only two Bible verses that mention him. So one of them is Judges 331 and another one is Judges 5-6. So if one or two people could read those Bible verses, that's going to tell us who Shamgar was and what it was like when he lived. We read it on the screen here, this one? 
oh no, that's just a comment. Like that's not from the Bible, but maybe oh. if you want to read um, Judges 3.31. All right, I, I got it. After Ehud came uh, Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad, he too saved Israel. What's an ox goad? Looks like the horn that he had in his hand in the picture. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's what I, I didn't know what it was either. So I had to look it up and it looks like it was like a weapon that was about three meters and nine feet long that had a sharp <laughs> metal point. So it wasn't just a dagger. It was, I think of what the ancient Greeks used to have. It looked like those like incredibly long, long spears with like, mm -hmm. and they would all like stab in unison. Looks like maybe it was something like that, except he was only one man who used a nine foot weapon to kill 600 Philistines. Wow. And it was pretty rough time that he lived in. We know that from Judges 5, 6. Um, so maybe someone could read that first. Five, six. I've got it. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. The travelers kept to the byways. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. And it's kind of vague at first, but what do you think that tells us about the times that Shamgar lived in? Sounds in dangerous. dangerous times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Danger. A lot of highway robbery. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. And, and I didn't really realize this because, like I said, I really knew nothing about him because there's only those two Bible verses that talk about him. But when I looked it up, they said that the name Anath referred to a Canaanite goddess. So some people think maybe he was the son of a mixed relationship. Maybe the mom was a Hebrew. Maybe the dad was a Canaanite. Or maybe the dad was a Canaanite and the mom was a Hebrew. Because why else would he have a name that referred to a Canaanite goddess? That's only speculation. Hmm. But either way, it showed that God can use anyone. He can use handicapped people. He can use people that come from humble beginnings. He can use people that come from godly homes. Um, he could also use people that come from pagan backgrounds. So now we got our next two judges that kind of go together, Deborah and Barak. And there's several chapters that are dedicated to them. So I encourage you, check it out tonight, read it yourself. It is very interesting because ironically, two women saved the day. Um, nowadays, it's common to have like books and movies where women are saving the day. Um, that's a place we're at in our society where they really like to promote that type of narrative. But back then, this was almost unheard of. This was crazy how God used two women to save the day. So we're going to learn about both of them, but especially Deborah, because she was a prophet and she was a judge. So if someone could please read Judges 4, 4 through 5, that's going to tell us about Deborah. And then you can keep reading to verse 9, and that's going to tell us about Barak. All right, I'll read it then. Uh, four, verse four, four, right? Four, four, and five. Now Deborah, prophetess, the wife of uh, Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She used used to sit under the the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel, in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. Okay, is that it? Now I gotta go to see Judges 6 and 9. Keep reading, Mark. Uh, she sent and summoned Barak, the son of uh, Abinoam, from Kadesh, Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you go gather the men of at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the, the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun? And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon, let me see, keep moving up here, with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go, but if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she, and she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah rose and went with uh, Barak to Kadesh, and Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and ten thousand men went up. Ten thousand men went up uh, at his heels, and Deborah went up with him. Keep going. Let me see. Thank you. So, how would you describe Deborah, and how would you describe Barak? 
I, I guess Barrick needed Deborah to help because he was chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and in the chart I sent you out earlier, they didn't even mention Barrick as a judge. They mentioned Deborah, but they didn't mention him. And I thought maybe that's because he's perceived as being cowardly. Um, he didn't manifest as much faith in God. So obviously Deborah saved the day. But he is actually mentioned somewhere else in scripture. So I assume he was a man of God. Um, he probably wasn't perfect. He probably should have had more faith. But he is actually mentioned in the faith chapter. So apparently his faith is something that we should model. Um, God can use someone who even has a little faith. And that's what it looked like he did with Barak. So if someone wants to read Hebrews 11, verses 32 through 33, this is where God lists all the great men and women of faith. What was it, Ashley? Oh, Hebrews 11, verses 32 oh. and 33. I would just say that he considered whether Deborah went with him, whether God was going with him. So he was um, only going to go if he believed that God was with him and that Deborah was with him was the sign he was looking for. Oh, that makes more sense to me because, okay, I always thought it was a, a lack of faith on his part, but then he was mentioned in the faith chapter. So I, I think what you said kind of clears that up for me. Okay, I have it. And what more shall I say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and uh, Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions. Amen. So he is also Amen. mentioned again in Hebrews 11. And yeah. I remember hearing a sermon on this, and they said, when we read this chapter, we feel like, how could I possibly ever be in that chapter? But if you look at people's backgrounds, they came from pagan backgrounds. Um, there was times where they lied. There was times where they manifested unbelief. And yet God used them. As soon as they turned to God, he used them. And the same thing with us. We certainly don't have perfect lives. But the minute we turn to God, he will use us. And that battle turned out totally different. Um, does anyone want to summarize the battle? It's two chapters long, so we're not going to read it. Um, but does anybody remember any of the high points of the battle? Another woman ended up saving the day, if that gives a hint. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so anybody remember it? I remember a sister was escaping. He, he, he was losing the battle, so he, he ran away. And then he, uh, he went into this, to this lady and she said, okay, go, go lay down a tent. I'm going to get you some milk. And she lied to him. And she went and got a steak instead. Anyway, jail. jail. Throw it through his temple. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Yep. Jail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't, Tell me I some didn't more. Want to that, that was a great summary. Um, jail, J A E L. She also saved the day as well. Drove that stake, drove that nail right into his temple. And she's even mentioned by name in scripture. And what's interesting is actually she was the wife of Heber, who was a descendant of Moses's father-in-law. So even though they didn't live with the Hebrews, there was people outside the nation who still worshiped the God of heaven. And I think this is a perfect example. Um, I'm, I'm not saying we should drive nails into people's temples, but I believe God used her. Back then, honestly, this wasn't really that horrific. Um, when people cut off each other's toes and fingers, um, I read a Bible commentary that said that was so common, that was not even really considered mutilation. Um, people did all kinds of crazy stuff to each other. So for this woman to do this, this was actually considered heroic. Um, this was something that was common back then. Um, she wasn't considered sadistic or anything. Um, she was actually commended because she showed her faith by her works and she was willing to endanger herself and even allow herself to be killed in order to do the right thing. And we have another judge, a judge that we're very, very familiar with, um, Gideon. There's several more chapters dedicated to him. So if you want to read a good story, check that out tonight. But another people group were oppressing the Israelites, the Midianites. And God raised up Gideon to rescue them. And this is another example of a theophany, which we talked about last week. Um, prior to Jesus coming, 
in about 2000 years ago, he was actually a period throughout history to different people in the form of an angel. And Jesus is not an angel. Um, the Bible says that we are created a little lower than the angels, but Jesus is the leader of angels. So this angel of God we know was actually Jesus because Gideon worshiped him. He accepted, he worshiped him. He bowed down to him and this angel accepted his worship. If it was a real angel, a created being, he would have rebuked him, but he was the leader of angels. It was Jesus himself. So that's why he was accepting his worship. And there's other examples of theophanies in scripture. Um, you could check those out and we will definitely reference them from time to time. But does anybody want to summarize Gideon's battle for us? Really interesting story, um, two chapters long. So if somebody wants to boil it down to a nutshell, that would be awesome. All right. Okay, you got, you got 32,000, that's too many. <laughs> Who wants to go home? You can go home if you want to go home. They still got too many. Go down to the brook and drink. Okay, Gideon, if, if they're drinking with their face in the water, send them home. If the ones that are looking around and drinking with their hand, those are the ones you want. But it's only 300. <laughs> that's a summary. <laughs> hey, you did a great job. Yeah, from 32,000 to 300. And as far as we know, not one single man lost his life. They all saved the day. And I, I wish my husband was here, but he used to be on the SWAT team in Naples. And they actually still use the same tactics. Um, I can't remember what it's called. If it's like the, the shock bang, I, I wish he was here. I'll ask him about it next time. But basically Gideon and his men, what they did is they covered the light. And then at the same time, they all made this huge noise by crashing their pots to the ground. And then they had this huge flame of fire that surrounded the Midianites. And because it was pitch black, they were temporarily blinded while they were hearing this huge noise. And it shocked all of them. And they actually started killing each other. And the SWAT team still uses that. I think it's called shock bang, where um, when you're like surrounding a house, you know they're probably going to be violent and you need to take them by surprise you'll have this stupendous noise and you'll have this crazy bright light that almost blinds the people. And it basically just like incapacitates them for a few seconds and then you do what you need to do. So they're actually still using a lot of Gideon's tactics today. And what's kind of ironic is um, a few hundred years later, Gideon actually, something similar, but we can look at Leonidas, at Thermopylae, at the Spartans, 300 Spartans fought off. It was rumored that it was a million Persians, but in the end, all 300 Spartans lost their lives. They're still brave. I still commend them. Um, at the end, they were tearing out eyeballs, biting off ears because the Persians had knocked their weapons from their hand and they had to fight with their bare hands everything they had left. And they gave their life for Sparta and ultimately for Greece. But all 300 of them died. If they would have had God, just like the Gideon and his men did, that story might have turned out a little differently. So there's obviously Amen. a lot of parallels that could be made. Um, but to me, that's a classic example. If you have God, all things are possible. You won't even lose a man sometimes. But if you fight for yourself, you still may be a hero. But in the end, you're going to lose your life. So these are some of the lessons that I kind of take away from Gideon. Um, does anybody have anything they want to mention? Um, anything that stands out to you about Gideon? Yeah. Gideon was a great, great man. Um, I thought his tests, were, his tests were very good. Mm -hmm. The tests yeah. that God allowed him to do. Mm -hmm. Amen. But there again, there's somebody that was questioning the power and had to have it proven to them through the, the wool on the ground in terms of which right. one was the dew made yeah. wet. So there was a lack of faith there too. But I think it uh, so often... We need to check to make sure we're not listening to the wrong spirit. Mm -hmm. And I think it, uh, that's what Gideon was um, able to do because God was um, with him. But I also think uh, one of the things that uh, I had looked up, uh, the Midianites were also relatives of the Israelites. Uh, they were... Um, children of um, Abraham's second wife. Oh. And um, their um, 
lineage was through one of the sons of the uh, uh, second wife of Abraham. <laughs> and, you know, all these people ended up being in the same area, of course. But they, uh, uh, and, and Jethro, uh, Moses' uh, father-in-law, was, uh, you know, from Cush. But that was, he was also a Midianite. And um, he uh, uh, was a priest, as we, we've been told. But Abatet uh, came directly down through what Abraham's family had uh, shared with him. Oh, wow. You know, it all goes back to like the horrors of um, polygamy. Not that, I mean, him getting married to her after Sarah died, there was nothing wrong with that. But you know, it just looks at like all these tragic fighting between family members. Like, you know, that's horrible. But thank you. I totally forgot about that, how they were rela related. Wow. And Gideon, I encourage you to read the rest of the story tonight. It doesn't end well. Um, he was a man of God. He was at the top of his game. He was a humble man. God really used him. But then after the battle, that's when he started getting puffed up and some crazy things started to happen. Um, the Bible says he had many many wives and it looks like here he had 70 sons so check that out later if you want to hear about what happened to Gideon after he won the battle because it's important that we learn about that so that we don't repeat the same mistakes ourselves amen amen Actually, there was, oh yeah what were you gonna say yeah there were two um verses that I asterisk that hit me in the story of Gideon and that was eight uh 22 through 24. And it says the Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Amen. Amen. Oh. I wish, I really wish he would have like lived like that for the rest of his life, because you know, when you hear the story in church and like, I know when I was taught it as a kid, I never really knew the rest of the story. And it, I don't think it was until I was an adult that I realized that he had apostatized. So he went from being probably one of the humblest men around, like what Jeff said there, you can't really ask for a better man. Like, look how humble he was. He's like, I won't rule over you. God will be your ruler. But then unfortunately things change. And when he died, he had 70 sons. One of the sons was Abimelech. And Abimelech, like what I showed you on this picture here at the beginning, those are all his dead brothers laid around him because he was jealous. He obviously wanted to be the judge. He wanted to be the leader. So he kills all his brothers. And that's his first recorded action. And then it throws the whole nation into civil war. You can read that more in Judges 9. Um, people are fighting. They're killing each other. Brothers are turning against fathers. Fathers are turning against family members. And it's just this horrible time. Um, but he ended up dying. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And certainly he died pretty shortly thereafter. Um, so does anybody remember, how did Abimelech die? A woman threw a millstone on his head, which you see in the picture here. And he was embarrassed being killed by a woman. So he asked his uh, soldiers to kill him and they speared him or took their swords to him. Ah, great, great summary. I, I don't know like why I'm smiling because it shouldn't be funny, but like I guess it it's interesting. It's not it's not necessarily funny, but it certainly is interesting because it does definitely illustrates the Bible verse, the wages of sin is death. So we also know that everything in the Bible is written for us to learn from. So what kind of lessons can we learn from Abimelech? Don't worry about powerful women. <laughs> well, you should worry about powerful women. <laughs> I think the, the women who played these roles are, of course, prophetically, what does a woman represent? It's the church. The church. Showing the role of the church in cooperating with God through faith. Amen. Amen. Our last judge that we're going to go through tonight is Tola. Um, we actually don't know much about Tola at all. 
Um, but he's a pretty profound man. I know the little I know about him, I'm definitely encouraged by. And that's why we're going to kind of end on him. Um, if you want to read the rest of the judges, you can continue the book of judges. I will also send out this PDF to you because as you can see here, there's a lot of historical information. Um, there's a lot of stuff from early Adventist writers that I have written down here. Um, if you're a history person, if you're a Bible person, I definitely want you to be able to check this out if it's interesting to you. But tonight, because Tola is such an important person, um, we are going to end on him. So if somebody could please read Judges 10 verses 1 through 2. I've got it. After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel Tola, the son of Hua, son of Dodo, a man of Ishikar. And he lived at Shamar in the hill country of Ephraim. And he judged Israel 23 years. Then he died and was buried in Shamar. Thank you, Mark. It seems like you're getting all the heart. You do such a good job with pronunciation, but it seems like whatever it's your <laughs> verse, it's always like the hard ones, but great job. And that's all we know about Tola from scripture is he served God for 20 years. But Ellen White in Signs of the Times, August 11, 1881, has this to say about him. So if somebody could read those three paragraphs, that's really who Tola was as a person. Unlike the proud and envious Ahimelech, Tola's great desire was not to secure a position or honor for himself, but to improve the condition of his people. A man of deep humility, he felt that he could accomplish no great work but he determined to perform with faithfulness his duty to God and to the people. He highly valued the privilege of divine worship and chose to dwell near the tabernacle that he might oftener attend upon the services there performed. Thank you. So he doesn't have any recorded sins. Um, as far as we know, he never apostatized. He truly was a man of God. Um, so what are some lessons we can learn from him? His humility, mm -hmm. trusting in the Lord is always a, a wonderful thing to do. Mm -hmm. right. I like that statement. It says not to secure positions of honor, uh, position or honor for himself. That was uh, different than Abimelech. Mm -hmm. So, amen. Amen. So are there biblical references to support that description? Or is that Ellen White's um, prophetic insights, I'll say? As far as I know, there's not any other Bible verses on Tola. I know sometimes the Babylonian Talmud, it's like a collection of Jewish writings. Um, a lot of it has to do with scripture. Sometimes they comment on different people. So I don't know if this particularly, I'm assuming this was prophetic insight, but she also had a huge library with like um, books from like different scholars, different commentators. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she got it from there or very possibly, I believe, you know, God revealed it to her. Does, yeah. does anyone else know? Like, does anyone else have any insight on that? Well, it's a rather unique uh, character for the leaders that we read about in Judges. It's kind of the opposite of what you see of most of them. So that's refreshing. Yeah. Amen. And if you guys want to check this out later tonight, I'll send it to you. Judge 9, JR, very interesting as well. Number 10, Jephthah. He was the one that had to sacrifice his daughter. People have debated for thousands of years, did he really kill her or did he just doom her to a life of perpetual virginity? And people go back and forth on that. Well, people actually wrote to the Ellen White estate. And this was when um, prior to the Ellen White estate where the Whites were personally answering letters and James White actually had a lot to say on this. Um, he looks at a lot of the scriptural passages. He looks at the words in their original context. And he will actually answer that question for you. And he does a great job of doing that. So if you want to check that out, did Jephthah actually sacrifice his daughter? Um, I will send you the link later. And you can read what James White had to say about that. Um, Ibzan, another great judge. We got Abdon, another one. Um, we're going to learn a little bit about the Philistines. It's going to come up a lot next two weeks because we're going to be studying first and second Samuel. So this gives you a lot of info about the Philistines. Samson, as we know, killed thousands of Philistines. So you can check that out more if you want. But in conclusion, there was always a pattern in judges. 
And um, Jeff, do you mind summarizing that pattern again? Because I thought you did such a great job. Oh, well, it, it was referred to as the yo-yo years because in fact, I added something after I thought about it. The Israelites would sin, they'd become oppressed, they'd repent, now the Lord forgave them, and then they'd find evil ways again and go back to their sinning. And that cycle just kept going around and around from sin to oppression to repenting to forgiveness back to sin. And it's easy to think like, oh, we're never like that. It's never going to happen to us. But Ellen White and Patriarchs and Prophets reminds us that it's still happening to us. And oftentimes it's happening because we're yielding to the influence of the world. We're conforming to their principles, to their customs, and we're doing this in order to secure the friendship of the ungodly. But then she says they're going to become our most dangerous foes. So we really need to be careful. Of course, we need to minister to the world. That's why we're here. But on the other hand, we don't want to be seduced by them. We don't want to be allured by them. We don't want to conform to them because then we're going to start doing the same things that the people and judges were doing. And mm -hmm. next week is actually a continuation of judges because Ruth took place during those 450 years. She was actually part of judges, but it's a totally different book because it might have a different author. Some people think the author might be Samuel. And it's considered a very beautiful love story. Um, it's much shorter. I think it's only like four or five chapters. So you can read it all in one sitting. And to me, it's just a great depiction of the fact that even when the people were sinning, there was faithful people all throughout the land who were serving God to the best of their ability. And that's really what Ruth is all about. So if you want to study for next week, I'll send you out this PDF. Um, I'll send you out some links to Ruth as well. And it's a great story. If you haven't read it before, you can probably read it maybe in like 20 minutes. And then lastly, I wanted to invite you to the Fort Myers Church this Saturday night, if you're free. Um, if not, that's okay. I know weekends are valuable. But the prophet Elijah actually struggled with some pretty massive depression. Um, he was actually so depressed to the point that he wanted to commit suicide. Um, but some incredible things happened. And before you know it, he snapped out of his depression. And pretty shortly thereafter, angels of God descended and they took him to heaven in a chariot of fire. He was translated. Amen. He never died. He's actually in heaven right now as we speak. So Amen. to me, if we look at that account, um, there's seven things that stand out to me. And there's seven things that if you personally struggle with depression, um, from my own personal life, I can tell you, if you do these seven things, you can certainly reduce, if not eliminate your depression. If you're not depressed and you just have a, like a family member, this might be able to help them out. And lastly, maybe you're not depressed at all, which is awesome. Praise the Lord. But you might go through a period of oppression or depression in the future. Um, sometimes you lose a job, a loved one. Uh, maybe you're at a time in your life where things really aren't going the way you would like them to. I can promise you that these seven things will certainly help you if you're struggling with any of that. So it's going to be a fellowship, a pot like a potluck. So if you'd like to, please bring a dish. Um, we're going to get to know each other a little bit. And then while people are eating, we'll have, it'll be about a 45 minute seminar. So thank you certainly for coming out here. Um, it's always hard to condense a whole book into one hour, but thank you for keeping it moving. <laughs> I think you guys did a great job. I certainly learned a lot. And next week will actually be Ruth. And then Saturday night will be a potluck seminar if you want to come out. Amen. So before we close, does anybody have anything you would like us to add to a prayer list? Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Kathy, lost her sister. If you would pray for Kathy's uh, recovery and help her through her grief. Amen. We also have a, a neighbor whose grandson, Nick, has just had a bone marrow transplant a couple days ago and is quite sick. So we'd like you to pray for his return to full health. So I was able to share a great con controversy with my neighbor, Dennis, and I'm praying that he reads it. Amen. Good. All right. I'm just ready to doubt these dates. Dennis, Nick, and Kathy? Yes. Okay. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for bringing us together, for giving us the ability to study and we know it's not natural for us to want to study the word of God. So the fact that we're here together, we praise you for that because it means that you're working upon us. You're filling us with your spirit and we thank you for that. 
So please bless each and every person on here. Bless their walk with you. Bless their walk with their spouses, with their families, with their friends. And we ask at this time that you especially be with Nick. Um, I'm sure it's very difficult for him, and I'm sure it's very difficult for his parents and for his grandparents. So thank you so much that Jeff and Lisa are praying for them, that they're remembering them. But I ask that you especially be with Nick and his family at this time. Please heal him, Lord Jesus, and use this as an opportunity to soften their hearts and turn them toward you. Please Amen. be with Kathy and the grief that she must be going through. Um, we know that many people around us are going through grief and through hard times. We ask that you comfort them with the love that only you can. Please come near to them right now. Surround your angels with them. Please just show them that you love them more than anything else and help them to realize that they can have perfect peace and comfort in you. And lastly, yeah. please be with Dennis. Um, thank you that he accepted the great controversy. This could totally change the Amen. rest of his life. So the devil is going to do everything he can to get him not to read it. And I ask that you just cast those evil spirits from him. Please surround him with your presence and please impress upon him the importance of reading it and of actually listening to what it has to say. Thank you for loving us and please bring us together next week in your holy and precious name. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.